Hey, Brindley. Brindley Butler, Butler, Brindley. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Here we are at Allen Gardens. Yeah. The beautiful. What do you like about Allen Gardens? Oh, I love the serenity of it. I love the fact that street people can sleep in the park. Uh, I love the flowers and the fragrance. and It just wakes you up in the spring. And I used to live really close to here, just a, a couple blocks away. and I came in here once, in fact, to quit smoking and it worked. It was beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's one of my favorite places in the city. And uh, I didn't like some of the changes it went through. You know, they cut down all the uh, the big shrubs so uh, gay boys couldn't have sex in the park or working girls couldn't have sex in the park. But I think that didn't enhance anything. I think if people want to have sex in public, they're just going to do it. And. Uh, as long as it's not in front of kids and it doesn't hurt anybody, I don't care. I think it's kind of great. I remember the first time I had sex outdoors. It was an Indiana blizzard, actually, and I didn't seem to notice the snow getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> and then I'll censor it from there. <laughs> Sexy Lita and the Sexy Swan. <laughs> Isn't that a sexy bugger? <laughs> mm -hmm. Anthurium erectus. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how a lesbian identifies an orchid? Oh. She starts salivating. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny story, I got, how I got into politics actually, because it wasn't until I was around 38 years old that I was uh, looking into my 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica and out fell this campaign card. And I'd never seen it before. I didn't even know it was in there. And uh, it was a bookmark that my grandmother had left when she was looking up Zoroasterism. And I happened to be looking it up too because, you know, 2001, a space odyssey. So there came the card, and I looked at it, and I said, gee, I remember as a kid somebody saying something about grandma being in the government, but it didn't mean anything, and I didn't even know what that meant, really because she, um, she died when I was seven. So my recollections of her were mostly comfort recollections, actually. But anyhow, so I'm looking at the card, and the card says, Minna Kathleen Bridley, um, candidate for city clerk, Whiting, Indiana. I thought, great, oh my God, she must have won, because that's what my memory was. So. It started to make me think about the political life that I had come from uh, because my dad was very political. And, uh, you know, and I, this, the date on that card was 1929, and I was so happy to see that it had a little Union Made label on it. You know, they used to print that all the time, uh, Union Made on, on any kind of literature that was actually uh, printed during, I'd say, the 20s, 30s, up to the 60s, perhaps. And still in some cases now, but not as much as it used to be. It used to be like a symbol of pride that it was union made. And um, it got me to thinking back on stories about her. One of the stories was that she, during the beginning of the Depression, she had a pie wagon. And in those days, 
people walked the neighborhoods of their cities and towns and did whatever they could. They sold whatever they could sell. That's how a lot of people made money in rag picking and recycling and doing all kinds of things. And uh, even though she died when I was seven, I remember the pies because the baking was just so amazing. So I figured that everybody knew her. She had been around all the hoods. She was selling pies. The pies were fabulous. So she just went around on her route and campaigned as she was working. And um, I thought it was kind of ingenious in a way because she got elected. And as it turns out, she was the first woman in the, uh, for the Democratic Party in the Indiana State Legislature. So that made me feel so proud. And uh, then in growing up, uh, my dad was always political. He always talked about political issues, about union organizing. I remember from the age of about 13 on, we used to uh, put out yeah. this um, local 513 AFL-CIO, Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers. He was uh, secretary treasurer of his union. And um, the reason I remember this is because it was the first time I'd ever smelled a mimeograph machine. And we would be cranking out the newsletter on the dining room table and sniffing this stuff. And it was like, ooh, is this interesting? And it made uh, stuffing envelopes, tearing union dues tickets, and doing all that um, a lot more interesting, shall we say. And um, part of understanding all that was uh, understanding that even though he was a very hard man and he had somewhat of a dictatorial household, he was an exponent of justice and he believed in the rights of everyone and he was a non-racist and growing up in Indiana, boy, if you met a non-racist, it was fabulous and you, went, and you met one in your own family, it was even better. So I started reading the newsletters and uh, oh my God, there was all kinds of stuff about race in them. And uh, part of it was uh, the whole concept of organizing uh, around Hispanic and black workers because the unions in the 30s and 40s, I mean, they killed people in riots over issues that were unbelievable and one of them was race and the fact that a black or a Hispanic couldn't get into this union because they couldn't get a job and they didn't, you know, some members believe that, oh, well, it's okay to hire them but don't let them join our union because we'll have to sit in the same room with them. So my father was writing this scathing material in these, in these little newsletters. And basically they were supposed to be, and they were, they were reports on membership, dues collection, all the mundane and boring stuff. But they also always had a slant to them. There was always a little message going on. And by the time I was 14, I remember uh, in Little Crown Point, Indiana, there was a drive-by and uh, basically what happened was after the last um, initial push to get the unions opened up and he was campaigning heavily for this and all his carpool buddies were telling him he was crazy and everybody was telling him he was crazy, um, this old uh, Studebaker truck came driving by our house and just splayed the front of it with shotgun shells. So that made me stand up and think, geez, I was only 14 and I wasn't that bright at the time, but you started to think, gee, this is kind of dangerous work and uh, he's willing to do it and he's got a family and he's got a, you know, a new wife and things like that and yet he was just adamant about pursuing this, this vision of his which was to bring all these people uh, into the union and uh, at the time he was really unpopular, except in the taverns, of course. Everybody liked a free beer here and there. And that was okay, as long as there were no blacks or Hispanics in that tavern. Right. So my dad would uh, occasionally drag people into the taverns that were closer to Gary, where there were bound to be uh, blacks and uh, Hispanics having their beer after work, too. And I remember hearing a big argument in our kitchen one time about um, a whole lot of carry on about going to these places and uh, what will our friends think. And it was a really good education for me. But, you know, when you're 14 and all your homo hormones are raging and you've already got a girlfriend and 
you're preoccupied with young love and whatever, you know, the union stuff was there, but it wasn't my primary focus. My primary focus was back basically practicing my trumpet and seeing my girlfriend, whether I was allowed to or not. Now that they're all gone, I can safely say I know how to climb a rose trellis with no problem. Anyhow, so um, that civil rights stuff was in there. And um, in me, it started when I was about 17. Um, it was the Kennedy-Nixon thing. And, um, you know, Kennedy was a Catholic, everybody hated him. When you're in a small town and you have a pass law and no blacks can stay there after 6 o'clock at night, you know that you have other sentiments that are pretty hateful as well. And of course, everybody that was a, in that town was a Republican, except for maybe, you know, I'd say maybe 30 to 50 people out of 5,000. So we were definitely in the minority in our thinking. So I remember getting in trouble from the U.S. history teacher, this jerk named Gruber. He had his own look on the Holocaust. Um, and then I reported him to the uh, superintendent of schools and my principal because he was uh, basically a zundel. He was a Holocaust denier. And I came home just running to tell my dad what I was learning in U.S. history. And um, he actually, much to my surprise, went to school on my behalf and uh, tried to reason with this teacher. And it went nowhere, but from then on the guy really didn't like me. And uh, he tried to get me expelled actually because I had a Kennedy button on and that I wore to school. And at the time, no one wore a political anything. You did not wear a political button to school. Um, I mean, you couldn't even wear pants if you were a girl, so a political button was completely out of the picture. So anyhow, I got in trouble for the uh, Kennedy button. But it didn't stop me from uh, noticing for the first time after about a four-year um, streak of bliss that my girlfriend was for Nixon. Well, talk about the first major fight in paradise. Um, it just stopped everything cold, and uh, I started thinking. And uh, thinking always brings me back to education and how important it was stressed in our family to get an education. And part of that was educating yourself around race, around sexuality. I know in our family library we had books by Natalie Barney and Gertrude Stein and Henry Miller and, you know, George Groves and people that were banned everywhere, including our local library. But yet these books were in my home, so of course I read them all and, you know, they were inspiration for early hormone activity, I'll say. Um, but nevertheless, education was always stressed and it wasn't so much about that if you're educated and you go to university and you do this and you do that, then you're smarter. It wasn't about that. It wasn't about being right. It wasn't about being smart. Education was always about asking questions. Get a little bit of knowledge, find out a little bit more, get as many sides as you can, and make up your own mind. That way you can have intelligent differences without wanting to kill each other. And it was a really invaluable lesson to me because when the Kennedy-Nixon thing came up, I tried so hard to listen to Nixon's point of view because my girlfriend was into Nixon and I thought she's mental there's no way my wife wears a simple cloth coat that speech about the dog checkers I mean we seem to know from 1952 on that the guy was a criminal he had a criminal look to him there was something about his whole essence and aura that kind of spelled liar and um, there was no way I could support any of his ideas Plus, in my gut by that time, and having read it, you know, I used to think that all the lesbians lived in France and Europe because I certainly wasn't reading about them in Nancy Drew, if you know what I mean. Um, so I had visions of all this going on in another part of the world, you know. Myself was somehow connected to all this. I knew that I was basically a lesbian, but I. I didn't have a way to articulate it because I thought all the other ones didn't live in the States, they lived in Europe. So I didn't have anyone really to talk to about it except my father. And amazingly enough, his response was that society would give me a hard time, 
but that as far as he was concerned, love was such a precious commodity that any love was better than no love. So he kind of made me feel good about being who I was, even though I was the only lesbian in North America. Uh, it was okay. Um, I didn't know about all the North American authors at the time because of what our selection was, but that was a politic in itself. Sexuality was a politic as well. And I was proud of my sexuality because in our house, what his word was, went. And if he's telling me it's okay to be queer, I'm delighted. I think it's great. So I start to feel great. So I start to get a little bit more open. And that's when the shit hit the fan, you might say, because uh, I remember coming home one time and just having this horrendous fight with my brother because I was friends to some of his. He was a year, two years ahead of me in high school. Of course, we got the same teachers. We, you know, we knew the same people. Um, I was into music. Most of his peers were into music as well. A lot of, especially the women. And he was just a little bit caught up in the fact that I was talking to these women and he couldn't get a date with them. Well, I wasn't dating them. I was talking to them. But he was so homophobic that he tried to just do my lights out uh, at the time and uh, really was physical, shall we say. And it was, it was a real awakening that it wasn't just that you could, it wasn't just that you could uh, find this in the world around you, but that it was in your own home. And uh, I was really freaked by that because I figured I believed all that crap about the family, that if you had a solid family, you would get support. They, if you had ideas that were a little bit different, you would get support around those ideas. And uh, it was okay not to have them yourself, but you know, you don't have to get violent because somebody else doesn't have them. So that taught me a valuable lesson as well. But it also made me very, very angry. So I kind of started walking around with a different posture in those days, and I always carried what I call a fist. My hands were always at the ready. I was always walking around with this fist. So the chip, the big chip and the fist, you know, it just got bigger and bigger. My grandmother died when I was seven, and I remember, uh, you know, how could I stay sane in this horrible atmosphere? And I always felt trapped in this place where I grew up. And, it was a big extended family ca catastrophe, shall we say, and I remember one time crying really hard, and it might have been when she passed away, I was only seven, but I found comfort in the earth, and it's really hard to explain, but it used to come to me all the time in a dream, and I'd go out running outside, and I'd lay flat on the earth, you know, face down, kind of, and I could just, I'd reach my hands out and I'd grab a hold of the grass and I'd just lay there and cry and cry and cry. And after a little while I'd feel this warmth come up out of the earth and it always seemed to envelop me in, in like arms and I'd get so much comfort from it that every time I felt this enormous stress and lots of despair uh, in my early years. Uh, I'd go outside and I'd lay on the earth and I didn't know it was the mother then. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew that it was a real comfort for me. Uh, it helped me get through really difficult things and as I got older and older it's funny, I, I belonged to a goddess circle for a while in, uh, uh, outside of Aurelia it was a little old farm setting and uh, we were all trying to, uh, you know, further enlighten ourselves and understand some of the goddess culture and so forth and so on. And uh, we would frequently go out and feel the earth and ground ourselves by being hugged by the earth. And it brought back all that really neat stuff that it was something that was always with you. Um, if you felt this despair, you could go out and find a park somewhere, your backyard, any place you could find, and just sit on the earth and lie back, and and all of that love would come up through the ground, and it would envelop you with this amazing hug. 
and I still feel that and it's that's one reason why I love Allen Garden so much it's such a sanctuary for your feelings and expressing them and getting comfort and you know looking out at all the people and being grateful that the park is here for them just like it's here for me Here he is. Beautiful Bruce. Wow. You know, his name used to be down there, but they, you can see, they made them all smaller. And uh, added other new ones, but. You know, we put a lot of Bruce's ashes here in the rose garden behind these memorial columns. And uh, at the time, I couldn't help but think, uh, gee, I wonder how many friends are intermingled here in the roses. I bet there's lots of them. And it felt really good to be able to put some of his ashes here, you know, by the memorial. And, oh boy, dear friends, dear, dear friends. Friggin' late 80s and 90s were, especially up to 95, 96. Oh my god, just people dropping like flies. It's very hard to cope with. It still, it's hard to cope with when you look up and you see people that you partied with, laughed with, drank with, smoked dope with just essentially enjoyed wonderful times. And I always think of those righteous friends because they just keep it all alive, really. Their bodies are gone and all that, but they're not gone. It's all very much alive. I'm really glad for the monument. And I love it that people leave tokens and they leave flowers and they haven't forgotten. They care deeply about their friends. It's really wonderful. <laughs>